Hello, hello, hello. Today is Pi Day, March 14, 2022. Solution to problem 138. We have a solid disk here. This is the center of the disk, the uniform disk, radius of the disk. We rotate the disk through an axis perpendicular to the paper through point P. And we offset it in counterclockwise direction over an angle theta. There will now be a torque in clockwise direction to drive it back to equilibrium. First question, when the displacement angle is theta, what then is the torque relative to point P? It is the cross product between two vectors. One vector from C to P, which has magnitude B, and one vector mg, which is vertically down to C. However, if you remember your cross products, you must multiply this by the sine of theta. Let's take a look. Here you see the cross product. The minus sign tells you that it is a restoring torque. We move the disk over an ang angle counterclockwise and then the torque will move it clockwise. So here you see the minus B sine theta and here you see F. What is the moment of inertia of rotation about your axis through P? Well, you may remember the parallel axis theorem. It is the moment of inertia for rotation about C plus M times b squared. That's just the way it is, I can't help it. <laughs> so you see here, it is the rotation moment of inertia about c plus mb squared. Very simple. Third question, the torque causes an angular acceleration about your axis through p. Write down the equation of motion in terms of angle theta and angular acceleration. Remember when we deal with non-rotational systems, we have Newton's law is F equals MA. When something is rotating, F is replaced by torque, M is replaced by moment of inertia, and A is replaced by angular acceleration. In this case, we would call that theta double dot. We're going to write down that equation. Here is the torque about point P. Here is the moment of inertia about P. And this alpha is not an angle, it is theta double dot. Angular acceleration. But we often introduce the alpha there, but forget the alpha. It is theta double dot. So now you see here the torque. You see here the moment of inertia, and here you have your theta double dot. This equation is a very famous equation. If sine theta is so small that it can be replaced by theta, theta in radians, then the solution to this equation is a simple harmonic motion. If sine theta cannot be replaced by theta, I wish you luck, it is a mathematical headache. We always deal with small angles, if we want to solve this, <laughs> because it's the only way we know how to solve it. Take 10 degrees and calculate the sine of 10 degrees, and then calculate how many radians is 10 degrees? And you will see that the two are very closely the same. I think they are less than 2% different. So for me, 10 degrees is always very small. That will see. D. The disk oscillates. The maximum displacement is theta maximum is very small, 
And the motion is near perfect simple harmonic oscillation. We just discussed that. Small angle approximation. What is the period of the oscillation? Well, that's now very trivial, because if you can replace sine theta here by theta, then you get this as a differential equation. And that differential equation, if the maximum angle is theta zero, that the, the solution to that differential equation would be that theta equals theta zero times sine omega t. Omega is then called angular frequency. And the solution is then this. And the period is 2 pi divided by the omega, that is this. Now, there is one problem left, one question left. As the disk oscillates, is there any force that the axis at P exerts on the disk? Well, of course there has to be. <laughs> For one reason, if there were no force at this point to hold the disk up, so to speak, then <laughs> it would fall down. The interesting part is that the force at P not only has to carry the weight of the disk, but it also has to deal with the rotation of the disk. That means it has to deal with centripetal acceleration. And that force is in a different direction than mg. So you would have to add two vectors, factorially. To calculate the force at P is more difficult than you may think. I will separately, on a large piece of paper, make a parallel calculation to calculate what the two forces are through point P in the case that this line is vertical. In other words, that this part of the disk has the largest velocity possible. If the disk goes to the right and stops, then obviously there is no centrifugal acceleration. But when point C is vertical under P, then C has the highest possible velocity, and thus there is the highest possible centrifugal acceleration. I will separately do a few calculations, they're very easy. I will take a rod. I will take a rod because it is simpler, but the method in principle is the same. And then I will calculate for the rod what the centrifugal acceleration is and what then the two forces are at point P, one that deals with the mass and the other that deals with the centripetal acceleration. So if you're ready for this, just hold on and I will add to this a second video. So here you see my rod. A rod is simpler than, <laughs> than the disc we had, but the principle is the same. So I chose a rod. Here's a rod length L and it has mass M. The center of mass is here. And I offset the rod, rotating about this point, counterclockwise direction, to angle theta. The center of mass of the rod has gone up over a distance one half L times one minus cosine theta zero. So when I release it, 
and I want to calculate the energy, kinetic energy of motion when it is vertical, then of course there is gravitational potential energy which is one half mg times this. And that now, when the bar is vertically down, is one half i omega squared. i is the moment of inertia of that rod, and omega is theta dot, the change in the angle, the unit time. So the centripetal force on C then, which you should perhaps brush up on, is always mv squared divided by r, but r is this radius which is L over 2. It is also m omega squared r because v equals omega r, so it's also simple. So this is equivalent to the same. i is one third ml squared, easy to calculate, but if you can't calculate it, then look it up. So now we continue that the centripetal force on the center of mass when it is in vertical, when it is vertically down the rod and you can use these equations is mg3 over 2 times 1 minus cosine 0. A little bit of algebra but not much. So it means now if you tell me what theta 0 is then I will tell you what the centripetal force is at the center of mass on this world. If theta zero is zero degrees, then there is no centripetal force because it was hanging there to start with and it never moved. So there was no centripetal force. If theta is 45 degrees and you put that in this equation, then you find that the centripetal force is 0.44 mg and if theta zero were 90 degrees, so you would start with the rod here and you would let it go, then the centripetal force is 1.5 mg. Check my calculations, I did it very fast, it's possible that I slipped up somewhere. Now, I always work during my MIT lectures in a reference frame that is my laboratory. That is very close to an inertial reference frame. That reference frame is not rotating. Newton's laws do not work in a rotating frame because a rotating frame is being accelerated and that means Newton's laws don't work. It's not a, an inertial reference frame. However, we physicists are clever. <laughs> we introduce a fictitious force which you would feel if you were in that rotating frame of reference. And that has the name centrifugal, centrifugal force. If you were in a centrifuge, which was goes horizontally around and you were inside, you would be put radially outwards of that rotating centrifuge. The magnitude of that force is the same as what we would call the centripetal force as seen from my reference frame. But for now keep in mind that if I move you to the rotating frame of reference that the centripetal force on that point C is outwards. So that centripetal force on that point C is then outwards, it's down. So at 45 degrees, that centripetal force is 0.44 mg. But of course the gravitational force is also still there. And so that point P has to deal not only with this force, which is pulling down on it, but it also has to deal with mg which is pulling down on that point P. So the total force on point P is then mg plus 0.44 times mg. And that means the force at point P is in the opposite direction, is the sum of these two. So this is easy, 
because it is in this particular case and the rod is vertical it is very clear the direction of the mg force and the magnitude and it is very clear what the effect is of let's say centrifugal force If you were to make similar calculations at a random angle theta, when it is on a swinging back and forth, this is not too easy. Uh, I have been thinking about problem 139. I may, I may come back to that. <laughs> so, we are done now with 138. Yeah, so you could use now the the disk and you would choose your offset angle theta zero which cannot be much larger than 10 degrees remember because we want the <laughs> simple harmonic motion and then you can calculate now also the centrifugal force when the center of mass is vertically below point P and then you can calculate the force on P total. We'll leave it with that and when you see 139, maybe some of this will help you. Maybe not. <laughs> we'll be friends forever and that's all that matters. <laughs>